Somebody had their second cup of coffee already. I like that. Good morning. Hey, my name is Emily Harmon. I'm a part of our Fellowship Kids team, and I am... I just love being in here with you guys. I'm so grateful to be a part of this family, whether you're in the building with us, some of you are in different rooms, some of you are connecting with us online. We just want to say welcome to everybody this morning. We're all here together, different channels, but we're all here to worship the same God through the same spirit this morning. All right, now I have three questions for you this morning. Question number one is, are you new, right? I can see a little bit of, a, of your faces out there, but mostly I'm just seeing bright lights. But pretend I'm making eye contact with you. I want you to know that I am excited that you're here. We want to welcome you to Fellowship Dallas, and we know that you may have questions this morning. And so if you do, we have a connecting center. We have ways that you can connect. So on the screen, you're going to see a number. If you have questions about how to get plugged in or want to know more about our church, you can text that number on the screen. Or if you're in the building, we have a connecting center right outside those doors. We would encourage you to go there after the service today to find out more about who we are and God's purpose for your life. Sound good? Okay, question number two. All right, I'm going to show you a picture on the screen. And here's what you may be wondering is who is that adorable clown baby in that picture, right? And what Dillard's catalog did they clip that picture out of? No? Yeah? All right, spoiler alert, it's me. That's definitely a handmade costume that my mom made. She put that hat on me because I was bald, all right? But you guys may know we have an event coming up called Trunk or Treat, but here's the deal. Things changed in Dallas this week, am I right? Okay, we know that we have been advised to take extra precautionary steps. So we have shifted. We are still going to have trunk or treat, but now we're calling it. Are you ready for it? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Trunk or treat story parade, all right? Now, you may have seen this in Fellowship Weekly. What on earth is a story parade? Oh, I'm going to tell you. It's amazing. That's all you need to know, okay? So what's going to happen is it's still a trunk or treat. We're still going to have trunks out in the parking lot. But we're going to make it extra safe. You're going to stay in the car with your family, with your kids, and you're going to go from trunk to trunk. But there's an element of story to it. And here's the thing. As you go from trunk to trunk, you will be on a quest, an adventure, all right, to find out this very important dilemma, which is, where is Waldo? Okay, we have got to find him, church, you with your kids and your neighbor's kids and your grandkids. Load them all up and get up here on Saturday and you will go on a quest from trunk to trunk in your cars to find out where is Waldo. It's going to be fun. All right, we've come up with very creative ways to deliver the candy from over six feet away into the cars. Pokios will be here. Come on. All right, Pokio's cookies, there will be a chance to take a picture with your family. Your kids can still dress up. So please register for that so we can make sure we have enough candy and sign up for the Trunk or Treat Story Parade. All right, sound good? Okay, question number three for you today is this. How can you make an impact in the life of this church? And I've got an opportunity for you today, okay? Every week we talk about giving, And every week we say that there are ways that you can give, okay? But I want you to think about it a little bit differently. Instead of just thinking about giving to this church, I want you to think about making an impact in the life of this church with the stewardship of your resources, all right? Investing in this church. On the screen, you'll notice there are three ways that you can give. You can text to that number on the screen. You can go online and you can give there. Or we have offering boxes in the back of the worship center. But I want to tell you a story about the impact this church has made on my life. Because when you're investing in this church, you're making an impact in the ministries of this church. And when I showed up here five years ago, I was a young mom with a brand new baby. I cried a lot, just as much as my kid probably. And I walked through these doors and I was lonely. And through one of the ministries here, I was able to find connection other moms came around me. They held, my, they held my baby when she was crying for me. They spoke godly wisdom into my life. They gave me friendship when I felt alone. And when my marriage was young, we were able to take repurposed a, a training experience here. And me and my husband were able to learn about the ways that God has uniquely made us in different ways. But with both of us with this call on our life 
to make God, to make, to give God glory and to give purpose to our lives for his sake. And when my kids show up for kids ministry every week, I know that they're going to walk through these doors and they're going to hear that God loves them and that God loves them even more and God loves them even more. And so when you're giving to this church, you're really investing in the impact of people's lives. They're being changed, okay? And so I want to encourage you in that this morning as you consider ways that you can give. All right, we're going to pray, and then we're going to worship together. You ready? Here we go. God, we, we love you. We are grateful for the chance to be in this room together. God, I am especially grateful for the impact that this church has made on my life, that I found friendship when I was lonely, that I found purpose in my marriage, that I know that my kids are hearing that you love them every single Sunday morning. God, thank you for the ministry of this church. Thank you for those who are investing in the mission of changing people's lives for your name's sake. God, we love you and we want to worship you this morning. All this we pray in your name. Amen. All right ready to worship God? Come on, stand up for me. We're going to sing to him about all the ways that we are grateful. Here we go. Good morning again, everybody. Welcome to Fellowship. I'm so excited to pour out worship to a God that deserves it this morning. Let's sing it out. This is the day that you have made. Whatever come, I won't complain. On my own, it's in your name. Now your joy awaits my praise.
God's so good, to, so faithful to us. Let's continue to pour out praises to him this morning. Come on, church. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, a faithful promise. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Oh, this storm.
this first line of prayer.
Can we sing the beginning line of that song? My hope is built on nothing less. I know I said it earlier, but let's just make this a prayer this morning. That we would put our foundation on what matters. That we would put our trust and our faith in a place that would never fail. We sing together. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing Dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. We want to trust you, Jesus. you this morning. We are so thankful for your presence here with us. God, I ask that that would become a reality for us, that the hope that we have, the, the places that we put our hope and where we look to, God, that they would be you, that they would be your blood, your righteousness. God, this morning be praised, be worshiped. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the death that you died on our behalf and that it is a solid foundation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all that you've done, for all that you continue to do. God, be worshiped in this place. Be worshiped in our hearts. We ask this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, fellowship. If you've got a Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 6 this morning. You can go ahead and turn there. It's good to be with you this morning as we continue our series called Succession. We're digging into the, to the book of Luke and talking about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And so we're, going to, we're just going to jump right in this morning. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 47. Here's what it says. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them... I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation and the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. So two years ago, Aaron and I uh, considered moving over to Rockwall. We wanted a, a, a little bit bigger of a house, a, a, a little bit more yard space uh, than what we had currently. Uh, and we found the perfect house online, right? Uh, just the right amount of space, just a big enough backyard for our kids to play in, updated uh, bathroom and kitchen. It, it was in our price range. It, it, it was one of those houses, right, you see, and you go, this seems a little too good to be true. And then we went for the visit of the house, and when we walked in, the first thing we see are these five-foot-long cracks along the walls. 
And they'd been covered up with drywall mud and paint. And you know what that means, right? Foundation issues. It was too good to be true. Buying that house would create a headache after headache, and we'd spend thousands and thousands of dollars on repairs of that house, all because the foundation was bad. See, how and where houses are built matters. If they're not built in the right place and in the right way, the shifts in the earth bring destructive patterns to the house. It brings destruction to the house. And that's true in life as well. There, there are going to be shifts in your life. You can't avoid them. You can only hope to, to lead through them and navigate them well. And, th- and that's why Jesus, in these verses, is telling us that he wants us to build our lives on the proper foundation, that when the waters come and the wind comes, we withstand all of those things. But Jesus is referring to something specifically here. See, right before this, starting in Luke 6, 20, Jesus has just preached the Sermon on the Plain. And Jesus tells his disciples in this sermon what kind of fruit they can expect to come from their lives as they follow him. He's telling them what he hopes to see in them as they follow him. So starting in Luke 6, 20, let's read some of this sermon. And turning his gaze towards his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Now, let's, let's think about what's happening here, right? Jesus is preaching this sermon. People have come all from all over to hear him teach, and he begins speaking directly to his disciples. And in this crowd are going to be some Jewish people. They're listening to Jesus speak, and they're, and they're living in a Roman-occupied territory. Rome has come in, infiltrated their territory, and they are occupying their land. And these uh, Jewish people are anticipating a Messiah, one who would come one day and liberate them from Roman oppression. And the Romans have placed government officials and soldiers to keep the Jews in order. And so when Jesus speaks about blessings, that the poor have the kingdom of God, that the hungry will be satisfied, the weeping will laugh, the persecuted will be rewarded in heaven. And on the flip side, that the rich will one only be comforted now, that the well-fed will one day be hungry, that those who laugh now will one day mourn, and that the adored will be done away with. The people begin listening and perking up. Could this guy be the Messiah? I can imagine them. They're, they're nodding their heads in agreement. Yes, he's validating the things that we see. He's validating the things that we believe. We, we are the blessed. The Romans, they are the woeful. So Jesus is, is saying, blessed are those who have nothing but God. Nothing but God and his kingdom. And woe to those who have a kingdom but no God. So they've been anticipating this Messiah for a long, long time. A, a Messiah who would come and bring them good news and who would start an awakening and an uprising. And so Jesus' next few words, they're hoping will be about the start of that uprising. It will be the beginning of their liberation. Um, I've told you before uh, that my six-year-old loves basketball. And so he uh, celebrated a lot last week when the Lakers won the championship because he's a Lakers fan. I, I'm sorry. I'm trying to turn him. I apologize to Luca and to the matter. I'm, I'm trying to turn his heart, but he, is, he loves, as he used to call him, LeBron James. Um, and so he's stuck on the Lakers, but he, he just started his second season of basketball. And, and after the first practice, he came home and goes, Dad, Dad, I got to tell you some exciting news. I'm like, all right, you know, like what happened? Like, I'm thinking like he got named like the starter or something, right? He goes, Dad, 
at the end of practice and then before our games, our coach gets us in a huddle and we all put our hands in and on three we all yell, Titans. I'm like, I don't, okay, that's cool, you know, it's their, but it's their battle cry, right? The, the coach brings them in and goes, guys, listen, here, here's, what I, here's what I hope for today. Here's what I want to see happen today. And we're going to go get them. Guys, we're going to win this game. Ready? On three, Titans. It's the pregame speech to get them excited. And, and so this moment for the Jewish people, they're thinking their leader has them gathered up and goes, guys, we're about to start an uprising. Here we go. And everybody puts their hands in. On three, okay, ready, guys? One, two, three. Go love your enemies. Wait. Did he just say, go love your enemies? That's exactly what he says. Look at verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And then in verse 36, he says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Wait, wait a minute, Jesus, wait. You just gave warnings about these people who are in power and abusing their power. Yeah. Love them. But Jesus, they, they oppress us. Love them. But Jesus, they, they are taking our money. They are taxing us. Love them. They, they mistreat us. Love them. See, see, Jesus flips the script on what his listeners were expecting. They're expecting, here comes the uprising. They're, they're expecting, repay evil with evil. Jesus says, repay evil with love. And these are the foundational words, some of the foundational words to build your lives on. That you, that, that we, would be known by our love. See, here, here's the reality. When you think about this passage, right, we, we all either have or we will have enemies. We will have people who do not like us. Enemies defined are, are those who actively oppose or are hostile to someone or something, usually because of some immoral or unethical behavior, some, some lines that have been crossed. But in our culture today, opposition, enemies, are being created simply for differences of opinion and belief. What we're seeing right now across our country is the right response to an enemy is, uh, to someone who's wronged you or doesn't agree with you or opposes you, is to hit the defriend button. It's to cancel them. It's to treat them as an outcast and to marginalize them. There's a man who uh, reached his 100th birthday. He was being interviewed by a reporter, and the re reporter said, Sir, what are 100 years, what are you most proud of? Well, said the man, I, I don't have an enemy in the world. The reporter thought, wow, how beautiful, how inspirational. The man replied, yep, I outlived every single one of them. <laughs> Is that your approach to dealing with your enemies, to dealing with people who oppose you or have a difference of opinion, to avoid them, to ignore them, to, to hope you outlive them? Or, or do you engage them with hostility? Hope bad things happen to them. Jesus tells us to be different. And he gives us four words, four words that will act as a, a solid foundation to live on. Four words that will allow us to stand strong when the raging waters of our enemies come crashing in. And here's the first two words. Do good. That's what he says in verse 27. Do good to those who hate you. Do good to your enemies. The, the word good there means noble. So, so treat your enemies nobly. And this isn't about feelings. This is, this is tangible action. Benevolent deeds that overcome evil and anger with love. Romans 12 says, says this way. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, 
If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, so this means, as followers of Jesus, that we, we must see beyond our enemy's treatment of us. We must beyond, see beyond our own pain and our own anger and, and look for the humanity in that person. It means seeing them as fellow image bearers, as people who were created in God's image. It means promoting healing in spite of how they've treated you. And it means taking initiative to do good in their lives. So, so who is that person that you have trouble with? It's in opposition to you that doesn't like you. And what good can you do in their lives? So if you've got that boss who's always hard on you and seems to just not like you, do some good this week. Show up early. Work hard. Buy them a gift for Boss's Day. And if you didn't do that, it was this past week, so put it on your calendar for next year, okay? Do some good in their life. Or maybe you have a neighbor, and you guys have exchanged words before. Or maybe they stole the political sign out of your yard. How can you do good to your neighbor? Could you invite them over for a picnic? Could you bake some cookies and take them to their doorstep? Could you offer to babysit their kids so they can go on a date night? What good can you do to that person to show them love? How can you practically love an enemy this week, hoping it might open them to the gospel or it might deepen their relationship with the Lord? So your first two words, do good. Your third word, bless. Do good and bless. Do good to your enemies, bless your enemies. Jesus says, bless those who curse you. See, doing good is about action. Blessing is about verbalization. The word blessing there literally means good words. So Jesus is saying, when it comes to your enemies, when it comes to those people who are opposed to you, speak goodness into their life. Speak truth and affirmation into your enemies. Shower them with praise and mercy. It means not speaking evil, it means not gossiping, it means not slandering. It means leaning on the Holy Spirit to respond with love instead of reacting in our flesh. Proverbs 18 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So, so every time we open our mouths, we have the opportunity to speak death or speak life. And fellowship, I, I want us to be known as a church known as a body of believers who speak life, who speak goodness into people. Listen, my, this isn't easy, right? My default when someone attacks me or someone verbally gets aggressive with me is to, I mean, it's a, to attack back, right? It's like, uh, it's like the old westerns, you know, like back to back, and then like we turn and I'm just firing. Until somebody goes down, we're going to just shoot away. But Jesus calls me to bless and not curse. So when it comes to blessing, who needs words of life around you? What people can you verbally affirm their gifts, abilities, or character? How can you speak life into an enemy this week, reminding them of who they are in Christ or who they could be in Christ? First three words for a, a foundation for our lives when it comes to dealing with enemies. Do good, bless, and the last one, the fourth word today is pray. Do good, bless, and pray. Pray, Jesus says, pray for those who mistreat you. See, something, something happens when we start praying for our enemies. It, it means as long as your prayers aren't like, God, just, God, take them down, man. I don't care. God, lightning. Broken leg, just take them. As long as those aren't your prayers, something happens inside of us that's really good when we pray for other people that are in opposition to us. Because prayer reminds you of their humanity. Prayer reminds you that they too are broken and sinful. Just like we are. And, and then what can happen there is, is your heart can begin to shift so that it's no longer just praying about your, their humanity and your humanity and humility for both of you, but it's, you begin praying for their good. 
praying for their heart, praying for their faith, praying that their relationship with the Lord deepens or maybe starts for the first time ever. But what if, like, what if you can't stand that person? Like, what if you truly despise them? Or they truly despise you? Or, or what if they're not safe to be around? Then, then prayer is where you start. You don't start with doing good and blessing. You start with prayer. And you, you tell God how you feel. He's not going to be surprised by that. God, I, you know my heart. God, I, I cannot stand this person. This person is not safe for me to be around. Lord, I need you to give me your Holy Spirit to give me supernatural love because I can't do this in my own power. Give me love I don't have and I can't produce on my own. And what will happen, right, again, is that prayer will soften your heart towards that person, reminds you, reminds us of God's love for us. Do you remember um, some of Jesus' final words on the cross right before his death and then ultimately his resurrection? Father, forgive them. That's what he prayed. Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know who they're killing. Father, forgive them. He was praying that for the people directly responsible for his death, but he's praying that for you and for me because ultimately we're responsible for his death. Father, forgive them. See, Jesus is calling us to be like him. He, he, he shows us the example of, of how to live this out. That's why in Luke 6, 36, he says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, Richard, but you don't understand. My boss is literally the worst boss I've ever had. Do good, bless, and pray. No, Richard, you don't understand. She stabbed me in the back. Do good bless, and pray. No, you don't understand. He cheated on me. Do good, bless, pray. No, Richard, she's a Republican. He's a Democrat. Have you seen what they posted on Facebook? Do good, bless, and pray. See, as disciples of Jesus, friends, we are... We are called to pass on undeserved love to the undeserving. Because that's what Jesus did for us. That he, he demonstrated his love for us, that while we were sinners, he died for us. And we should treat everyone else like he died for them. Because he did. And I want to say one more thing before we begin to close this morning. I want to tell you something that's, that's been on my heart, and uh, in some ways it's, it's uh, just broken my heart. In some ways it's made me angry, but it's something that I'm seeing happen time and time again. And, and it's the nastiness that I've seen on social media. It's the nastiness I've seen between people both Christians towards other Christians and Christians towards those outside of our faith. See, everything has become a versus. Masks versus the anti-maskers. Vaccinations versus the anti-vaxxers. Biden versus Trump. Republican versus Democrat. Science versus faith. Your, your science versus my science. I want to be real clear with you this morning. I am not your enemy. It does not matter what I believe about any of those things I just mentioned. I am not your enemy. The person sitting next to you this morning or, or three feet from you this morning is not your enemy. It doesn't matter what they believe about those things. See, this, this love we're talking about, it's still countercultural. 2,000 years later, this love is still countercultural. We have an opportunity to show non believers what we're all about. We have an opportunity to invest in our successors and to see them grow up to be people of love. 
And see, and if your issue is with other believers, can we stop focusing on the, the little things, the temporary things that we disagree on, and focus on the thing that we agree on the most? That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That we are united in him. We are one in him as brothers and sisters of Christ. Fellowship, we have the opportunity to be a beacon of light and love in a really dark place. We can pass down an incredible legacy to other followers of Jesus, our successors. And, and I, listen, I, I hope you'll join me in that, that you will do good, you will bless, you will pray. We all know about uh, the Vietnam War. Over three million soldiers and civilians were killed in that war. But most of us have probably never heard the name Brian, or sorry, Bill, I know a Brian Kimball, Bill Kimball. <laughs> Bill served as a mortar man in the war. And in 1988, some, some 20 years after he served in that war, God gave Bill a vision for the Vietnam, Vietnam the country, and its people. And so he started a ministry called Vets with a Mission, or VWAM. What Bill hoped and what Bill desired was to go back into an enemy country and help rebuild it because of the incredible destruction that they had experienced. A year later, joined by other Vietnam veterans, VWAM took their, their first trip into Vietnam to help out, to lend aid to a, a dilapidated uh, uh, orphan, orphanage. It was a uh, polio orphanage. And what those guys did, they went back there and they resupplied the orphanage with fresh water. They built a border around the orphanage for protection. They updated the braces for the children. They, they helped fix a therapy pool. Their work brought literal healing to children who were experiencing incredible pain. And on that trip, former enemies began shedding tears with one another. Hugs were exchanged. Healing took place, and their lives were changed forever. And to this day, VWAM continues to take trips into Vietnam. They continue to support churches in Vietnam. They continue to send Bibles and Christian literature into Vietnam. They, send, they continue to support the country with medical care. And I love this quote about VWAM's purpose and mission. It's what it says on their website. It is the ministry's heart's desire to see the people of Vietnam know that former enemies can come together in forgiveness and reconciliation to each other. The purpose and the prayer of VWAM is that the Vietnamese on both sides of the war, as well as U.S. veterans, can come to the understanding that every man, every woman, and every child can be reconciled not only to former enemies, but to God and our Savior Jesus Christ. See, if Bill Kimball and other former veterans can, can go back into the land of their enemies to give aid, to, to pray, to build, to restore, and to speak the gospel into the live, lives of former adversaries, surely we can go back into our homes, into our neighborhoods, into the places that we work, and do the same. And when we do, we, we stand tall on a, on a foundation of love, a love that only comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ. Fellowship, let's do good. Let's bless. Let's pray. Literally, we're going we're gonna to pray now. So I want you to stand with me. We're going to pray. And Noah is going to come and lead us in another song this morning to close out our time together. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that this isn't just some good idea you had. This would be how you lived your life. Giving love and grace to those who didn't deserve it. Giving us love when we were still sinners, when we were still considered your enemies. And we thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection because in those things where we have life and we have your love and we are able to in turn give that love to other people.
And so, Lord, I, I don't know the situations that my friends here are, are facing. I don't know who's in opposition to them. I don't know who their enemies are. But I know that you love them. And so would you help us as your followers here at Fellowship Dallas to be people who love our enemies well, who love people in opposition to us well, that we would do good, that we would bless, and that we'd pray. I want to draw us back to that line that we sang earlier, my hope is built on nothing less. Let's sing this out as we close this morning. holy one more time.
Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the price that you paid for us, God, that you forgave us. We ask this morning that you would give us the strength to forgive those who've harmed us the same way that you've forgiven us, God. We praise you for your death on the cross again this morning. Be praised in our lives this week as we leave this place. God, as we go back to our lives, strengthen us and give us your spirit. We ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen.